I am Rachel Woody. I'm here with Jim McDaniel, and we're at the McDaniel Family Home. It's September 17th, 2015. And Jim, I'm going to go with a different first question for you, given your family history. I would love to know how your family came to be in this area and, and sort of where it all began here. Would you mind telling us that story? My family history begins <clears throat> in two places. Uh, in Dundee area, which uh, the Shucks were the first settlers here in Dundee, and that was on my mother's side. Mm -hmm. And they go back seven generations or seven or eight. I'm not sure how many. But uh, anyway, we have a lot of distant cousins around here. And on my father's side, <clears throat> uh, they came to Oregon in 1844 and settled in the Ricreol area. And we have uh, a lot of knowledge of that, including the family Bible. So uh, that's our original background. Mm -hmm. And I believe, I know in speaking with Donna Jean, there's quite the McMinnville College, Linville College connection. Yes. I know we'll get into that in a different interview. But my, my next question for you, if you're okay to move on from the family history is, how did you go from the family business into the grape growing business? I'm gonna start back at an early time. Uh, okay. And that is, when I was in high school, I surreptitiously made wine from uh, raisins. It makes a nice, frothy wine. And it doesn't take very long in a warm spot. And then I made beer, my friends and I made beer in an outhouse, uh, that is an outbuilding um, on our family farm. And then when I was graduated from the University of Oregon in 1952, I was stationed uh, in the San Francisco area, and more specifically in the Livermore Valley, where there were several wineries even at that time, uh, uh, Benty and uh, Con Cannon, among others. So I took the opportunity to taste the wines and enjoyed them a lot. So when I came back, I uh, continued to buy a wine wherever it was available, which was not very often. Most stores didn't carry anything except, uh, um, well, we called it Dago Red. It was the wine of stuff. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I, I uh, continued subject. And that's what led me to then consider getting into the grape growing and the wine production business. And um, shall I start about David Lett at this point then? Whatever, wherever you want to go, I will follow. Okay. Well, in the spring or early summer of 1970, uh, Lett was preparing to make some wine, at least he was hoping to. He had grapes coming on, and he wanted a place to make the wine. So he went to Tom Gunnis, uh, who was a loan officer at the First National Bank in McMinnville, and said that he wanted to uh, get a loan to put up a building for, for winemaking. And uh, Tom said, well, he called Tom, called me on the telephone, and he said, I've got some crazy guy here that wants to make wine in Oregon. And so he said, let's, uh, let's get together for lunch at the Blue Moon Tavern in McMinnville and uh, listen to what Led has to say. So we did that. We had a good time. And, of course, Led knew what he was doing. Uh, I was no was no uh, factor in that. So, um, I mentioned about 7th and Alpine and 10th and Alpine. Our office, which uh, was located there, and uh, that location began as a business in 1929 when my father bought what was called the old Hauk building at that time. And he became uh, a part of that area and was one of the original in influential businessmen in McMinnville at that time. And um, we continued that business until 1985 when I retired and my brother a little bit later. So anyway, our office for that uh, business was located at 7th and Alpine. And um, we bought a building later on 
for packing eggs, I got the wild idea that I was going to get into the egg production business, which didn't work out very well. But anyway, we did have that building open mm -hmm. and offered it to let for, I think, 40 or $50, maybe $60 a month. Okay. And uh, my brother didn't like that very well. Why is that? He, uh, <laughs> he thought it was a pretty foolish thing to do. Uh, well, we weren't getting anything out of it anyway, so what's the difference? Mm -hmm. Foolish because why wine? Why That's wine? right. Uh. And that brings up another subject. And when I told him, that is my brother, why that building uh, was needed and what was going to happen there, he said, make wine? Who the hell's going to buy wine in this area uh, except the winos? <laughs> I said, well, you'll see. Uh -huh. And there's a side issue on that. Yesterday, when I was in in McMinnville talking about the Granary District, I went into the old office that we had later on, which had been formerly the Buchanan Sellers office, which we owned eventually. And um, that's owned by uh, Rob Stewart, our Stewart company. Mm. And lo and behold, all over the floors were stacks of wine cases and everything paraphernalia having to do with winemaking. So that was the final answer. Who the hell's going to have anything to do with wine in McMinnville or the state of Oregon or Washington, mm -hmm. for that matter? So I thought that was rather ironic and maybe even appropriate. <laughs> so anyway, having to do with lead. Since I uh, took part in making uh, the first wine. I wasn't really heavily into it, but I did. I, I um, turned the screw press like that. Mm -hmm. Dave said, don't do, do that hard. That makes bad wine. You, you, I think you get too much phenol into the, uh, into the must there. And uh, then one Sunday, we had friends to dinner at our house. And David called and said, I need some help. I have some barrels in a railroad car, which was just a few blocks down from his winery, winery there. And you have a lift truck we can use to get those out of there? And I said, yes. So my friend Joe and I got the lift truck and we went over there and we helped him get the barrels. Mm -hmm. And Steve and Mike. And what? And Steve and Mike, you drafted your kids. Oh, they did too? I didn't remember that. Mm -hmm. Steve was Joe's son and Mike was our son. So <clears throat> we, we did have a hand in the whole situation there on a minor scale. Mm -hmm. So I got the bug. I had to have a vineyard. And I started looking around uh, soon after that. And uh, it, of course, had to be the Dundee Hills. Why do you say that? Pardon? Why, why, of course, the Dundee Hills? Well, because that's where David Lett was. Ah. And uh, no other place would do. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there were many other places available. Land prices weren't too high. Uh, and when I found some land, uh, after much searching, uh, we paid, I think it was a thousand an acre. It had been formerly, that land had formerly been platted as residential areas in the Dundee Hills in the 1890s. Dundee Orchard Homes number one and two were the official plat names. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to back up a little bit here and discuss the search for the vineyard. One of the first things we did was to, uh, I just walked around in the hills and I talked to a man named John Witter, who owned much land there in the south end of the Dundee Hills, and he wanted to start selling it off. And I believe a Winters Hill uh, winery is, is his family. Okay. And so he said, well, I've got this nice piece of ground right over here, and looking out over the south, and we went over there. And uh, unfortunately, driving up to that site, it was like going through a, a slumlord area. 
because it was a lot of old uh, RVs and trailer houses, uh, people camping out there, and it was not a pleasant place. And secondly, it was in the Dayton School District, and uh, Donna Jean didn't want to have anything to do with the Dayton School District because we had children in school. Not that it isn't a good school, but she felt that we could do better somewhere else. And so I started looking around at other places, uh, including uh, right next to where the uh, uh, Let Vineyard is now, which is now the Sokol Blosser uh, location. And I, I kicked myself in the rear end for not getting that because it's a good location. And a later time, I walked around through the hills here one day, and I began to get sort of tired and hungry. And I was over by the, where the marsh place is now. Mm -hmm. So I stopped and, and I saw Lois Marsh there, and she said, uh, well, have you had any lunch? And I said, no, and I'm hungry as hell. And she cooked a hamburger for me. And that was one of the, the kindest things I can remember was Lowy Marsh uh, saving the day. So, and so eventually, then we came one day to Dundee at Ninth Street. And that little building there, which has been used a variety of things, it was a barber shop at one time and so on. At that time, it was a real estate office uh, owned and operated by a man named Kenny Gum. And listed in that place for sale was land in the Dundee Hills here up Ninth Street, Warden Hill Road. And um, we expressed interest. And so Gum called uh, Jim Marsh, and she, he said, well, we've got a prospective client here. You want to come down and get him and show him around? And, and Jim said, oh, why the hell, are, what are you doing here? Why don't you do it? Well, uh, Jim came down anyway. Uh -huh. And he showed us some land which belonged to Jim's mother-in-law, Mrs. Hansen. She owned quite a few pieces around there for some reason. Maybe she was just speculating uh, on land there. And eventually, um, Vivian and Arthur Weber bought the site that I liked the best. And then um, later on, we also bought 10 acres along Warden Hill from um, Mrs. Hansen too. So anyway, we didn't do anything right then, and I don't remember exactly why. So I continued to look, and uh, eventually, through the real estate office of, um, it was in Newburgh at the time, uh, out east of town there, uh, Walt, well, I can't remember the name of the realtors, but anyway. They had some listings for these Dundee Orchard Homes locations, which there were quite a few, very many. And they came about because the owner of that, the Allen Fruit Company, had planned on making those home sites according to the original planning. And however, they weren't able to make it go and they were bankrupt. And I think it eventually became uh, ownership of a standard investment. I think I saw those signs there. But those plantings were all available, and actually there were corner stakes in each location for each piece. And I found some of those stakes eventually, little white stakes about so high down in the woods. So, uh, Reset, yeah, Walt and Rich Reset were two of the realtors. So they took me up there and showed me this one particular spot that I thought looked good, which was on the, the uh, east end of the hills here. Mm -hmm. So I walked out there from the road, the county road, walked east and then looked out over the hills and I could see Mount Hood and all over the place and I thought, well, this is the place. Mm -hmm. I've looked long enough. So. Um, we bought it, and uh, my dad helped me uh, buy it 
through a loan and also in order to finance it fully I sold my red 1960 to 1969 uh, Mercedes uh, 280 SL which I wish I had now because it, was, <laughs> it would be a couple of hundred thousand I've seen it listed in the in the internet recently but it probably proves how much he really believed. That's right. Yeah, in your vision. Yeah. Well, those are all milestones along the way there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but strong remembrances. We, the first thing we did then was to do some clearing. We got a man who was a capable logger because there were some big trees down below the lower part of the lot. And incidentally, before we did that logging and clearing, there was a herd of elk living around in there, but they disappeared. The original upper part of that property uh, had been a prune orchard, and which had blown out in the 1962, it was a 60, uh, 62 Columbus Day storm. So there were a lot of old prune trees around there, and we pushed them down into the woods to get the, the, the lot clear mm -hmm. and uh, then developed a plan for planting the vineyard and also the first thing we had to do of course was to dig a, uh, dig a well which we did. In fact uh, uh, Walt Reset was the one that told me when we hit, hit water he saw me somewhere in McMinnville and he said well you've got water it's so many feet I don't remember what. 600. Was a 600, and this has proved out to be a very successful source of water. And uh, Don Olson, who now has that place, has used that uh, uh, in various ways, including hoping to bottle water from it. I don't know whether he ever did or not, but it was his plan, which uh, irritated the neighbors. So anyway, we had a well. And the next thing was to get some vines. Well, uh, where? Mm -hmm. How much? Mm -hmm. And this was about um, 72, I think. So I got cuttings from Lett for Chardonnay. And eventually uh, I had those uh, uh, propagated by my uncle who had access to a greenhouse in Hillsboro. And he put them in the hotbeds there and sprouted them. And uh, then they were eventually ready. And we have pictures of those vines in our daughter Carrie's book here. You might want to look at later. Okay. So uh, we started making plans uh, of just how to go about doing this. So I, I called uh, David Lett and I said, now Dave, how the hell am I supposed to plant this vineyard? And he said, for $100, I'll draw a map for you and what to do and how to do it. $100? Okay. <laughs> so he did. Okay. He wrote it all out. And then he said at the bottom, when you get all this done, Bacchus will smile. Oh. And I wish I still had that letter. Yeah. Because it would have been a, 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 a real relic mm -hmm. from the past and uh, how to plant a vineyard. So we eventually um, set about doing it and uh, I bought a cable with a plastic covered cable to run the lines down there <clears throat> and Don and Jean uh, did me the favor of indicating where each plant would go on that cable. It was supposed to be um, six feet apart. The vines were going to be six feet apart. Mm -hmm. And this was in contrast to the uh, planting methods being used in California at that time, which was nine by 12 in distance. But obviously that was not Oregon. And of course, as you know, it has even gotten quite narrow now. I don't remember six by six or I don't know. It's very, very close. And so Don and Jean made that cable. <laughs> as it turned out, it wasn't quite right, as she could tell you, tell you what she did there. I will definitely make 
make sure to ask her when she's up next. Yeah. She, uh, did you enlist the children to help plant as well, friends and family? How did you get the workforce to put a vineyard in? Well, we did the best we could, and I'll explain then. Okay. We bought a shovel. <laughs> <laughs> a spade. Practical. And uh, we used the spade to dig all the holes for the first vineyard. It was in March, and there was enough soil in the ground, enough moisture in the ground that we could do that. Mm -hmm. And one of the people that helped me was a man named Frank Parks, who was studying for his PhD at the University of Idaho, I think. And he wanted some exercise, but he got it too, because we, we worked the hell out of it. But he liked it. And incidentally with Frank, he had documents and description of what was happening in Idaho at that time to start a winery industry. Oh, wow. And he gave those to me, and uh, I later gave it away, unfortunately, to someone else, which I'd like to discuss a little bit later on that subject. Anyway, they, they, um, they were trying to start a winery industry in Idaho. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was called St. Chapelle, I think it is now, I'm pretty sure. And they do have a winery district there now, I know, because I was recently reading a book about the Oregon Trail. Okay. And a man and his brother made a trip in a wagon from Missouri to Oregon within the last few years and wrote about it, wrote, wrote a very good book. And they talked about the vineyards and wineries in uh, Idaho at that time, so I guess it succeeded. Mm -hmm. And um, that's just a side issue. So you're planting a vineyard for the first time. Yes, all right. Chardonnay from David Flat. Did you get anything else? Any other varietals? Well, that leads to a lot of discussion. Oh, okay. Well, the Chardonnay, by the way, was the Clay Draper clone from California, mm, okay. which was, is ultimately not a success here because it's very late ripening. Mm -hmm. It was developed at UC Davis for California conditions. It makes a delicious wine, but it's so late ripening that it's questionable if it ever is ready. Okay. Uh, now, at Torrey Moore, where they own that land now, uh, Don Olson told me that they won some prizes recently from uh, uh, wine from that uh, uh, clone, uh, the Draper clone. So it has had some uh, success regardless of its ripening problems. So anyway, we, we, we got our cable out there and we went down the line and so on. Mm -hmm. It all worked out pretty well except I chose to have a, an avenue in the middle of the vineyard. Okay. And um, unfortunately, by the time we got from the top down to the bottom of the vineyard, the two lines began to converge a little bit. It, it didn't quite work out as I had planned, but anyway, it didn't make that much difference. It was just a slight visual thing. Mm -hmm. And it was later planted, the, the avenue was later planted by the Argyle Winery, who leased it. So back to where we were. Um, we planted the vineyard, and then uh, the subject came up about living there. And I said, well, I, I, I can't work that vineyard. I can't do that unless we live there. And Don and Jean said, well, I don't like that idea very well. And let her tell you what her viewpoints are there. <laughs> I will get her on camera for those. <laughs> what, what were your thoughts, you know, moving a family to the vineyard. Well, at one point I thought it was a pretty stupid idea after we, after we moved. Uh -huh. Because we moved in September. We started a house in spring. And then we planned on moving in September. And we sold our house in McMindle, which is still there on uh, Elmwood on Brockwood Hill. And we got the use of two uh, 
mobile homes, house traders we'd call them before. Uh, and in one, I, Donna Jean, our daughter Carrie, and two dogs were living there. And the next one adjoining was our daughter Claudia, and she was a senior in high school. And she took, required that entire trailer. So it was it's four to one, but <laughs> it worked out. And I thought several times at night, lying awake there, I thought, where the, why did I do this? I'm not so sure this is a good idea. It's not very comfortable. And we had a nice house in McMinnville and uh, we were at some disadvantage at this point. So it worked out. Anyway, um, in December of that year, 74 was it? I think 74. Two days before Christmas. Two days before Christmas. We told the building contractor, we have to be in that house, if nothing more than just the kitchen, and which we did. We moved into the kitchen, mm -hmm. and the rest of the house was still being worked on. And uh, our clothes were in the basement there, and we're in the uh, cardboard boxes with hangers. But anyway, we got out there on Christmas of uh, 19... 74, I guess, was it? That's not too bad. Probably didn't seem like it at the time, but... And our son Mike and my nephew Tim put up a Christmas tree there. And the house has a very high uh, open area in the front. And the Christmas trees was huge, went way up there. Yeah. So they had fun getting that Christmas tree. So anyway, when we built the house, I thought, well, I'm going to make wine here. So the lower part, the basement, was done in such a way that the ceilings were, I think, 12 feet high, which required a lot of concrete. And by that time, we had poured that concrete. We had spent a lot of money and didn't have much to show for it because there was so much concrete in there. But it worked out there all right. We had a nice little spot for making wine, and we had floor drains. And we had an exhaust fan in one wall to bring out the CO2 fumes as the wine was fermenting. And we made wine there for some years, which uh, actually we bootlegged. We had the carboys, five gallon carboys, and I'd fill those, I'd sell those to friends and acquaintances mm. who got a good buy. And I didn't go to jail. <laughs> So it, uh, it was just all part of it. And I really enjoyed making that wine. But as time went on, I'm not so sure I thought that I want to do this because it's a lot of work and uh, it requires a lot of attention to detail and a lot of my time while I was still working at a full-time job in McMinnville and commuting back and forth and also after we moved out here, it, I'd have to get up early in the morning and either prune or run the tractor and come home at night and run the tractor and spend my weekends doing that. Mm -hmm. And that was typical of, of a good many of the people that have gotten into the wine business at an early time. They, they supported themselves by other jobs. Uh, David Lett, of course, is a good example of his book selling activities. And Arthur Weber, too, who was a book textbook salesman and, and a publisher from Boston. So as time went by, I began to tire of it. And in 1985, I retired from business in McMinnville. I'd been re commuting ever since, though. And I thought, well, maybe it's the time I just should sell this vineyard. Uh, I don't want to work too hard anymore. I've I've had plenty of uh, career, and why should I work hard anymore? Will you get me a glass of water, please? Would you like to take a break? We can pause. Oh, just a little water would be fine then. So <clears throat> we did sell the, the, uh, the location, the building, the house, and the vineyard to Dr. Don Olson 
who still owns the location there. He was working as a physician in Nevada at that time and didn't want to move up here. So he said, well, why don't you just live there for a year and I will give it to you rent free. Thank you. Which is all right with us. Gave us a chance to look around for a new home. And it took a long time to find a place. And uh, Donna Jean, my wife, was not so sure that it was a good spot even then when we moved. But anyway, we did. <laughs> it was a house that I liked that was an old style. Uh, a house that had bought, the parts had been bought from Sears and Roebuck in 1916, was it? And it had been built at another location called, uh, and the location was called Copper Gold, which is over north of Newburgh. And that was a, a famed farm at that time, the Copper Gold Farm. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> eventually, two engineers who were working at uh, Allen Fruit decided they were going to buy that house and move it over to the present location of uh, 2708 East Roberts Lane, north of Newburgh, just off of uh, Zimmery Drive, close to where the Allison Inn and Spa is now there. And they reconstructed the house. Well, they didn't reconstruct it. They renewed it. They, they uh, put new plumbing in and all that sort of thing. And uh, they almost lost it on, on, when they got it over there, they put it up on stilts and a big wind came over and it almost blew over. It's a huge house, so it would have made quite a crash. So we moved there in, uh, uh, let's see, 85, 80, 86, I guess. Must have been 86. We sold 85, yes, it was 86 to 2708 East Roberts Lane. It was a wonderful old house. It was, it's called a neo-colonial, I believe, is the style. And there are a few of those around here in New yet. One quite nice. So we lived there for quite a while, and I indulged my interest in landscape architecture, which had been an interest for some years. Uh, since we had lived in McMinnville, I planted a large garden there, and I thought, well, here's a good place to really uh, do the things I want to do. We had two acres of land, and we were able to spend all the money we wanted to spend, and, and some more, too. And that went on nicely. And then in, um, I think, 96, we decided, well, there again, We've done our thing here, it's time to move on. So we sold, uh, we split it up in two pieces, two acres each, two acre lots, and uh, moved on from there uh, back to the Dundee Hills. And we built a house on Viewcrest up above us here. And then we, uh, lived there until, I don't remember, do you remember? 11 years ago. How long? 11. 11, years ago. yes. And in the meantime, we lived in a house over here, near down the hill here. Well, the house is being built. And, one? No, well, it was, it was on, um, Dogwood. Then we moved into the Viewcrest house and decided the house was not too too good for us because the main level was on the second floor. It had a beautiful view, but living on the second floor, always walking up and down, mm -hmm. it got to be a problem because we were aging and it wasn't very handy. So we sold that. And then 11 years ago, we sold that and we moved over to Birch Street as another rental and built this house. So we've been here since 
2004. So you and really have been all over the Dundee Hills. We have been all over. <laughs> uh, well, we had fun, and as you, as you have commented, this is a nice house. It fits us well mm -hmm. for two people. Mm -hmm. We have this level here, and then we have a, uh, another level below, and that's where my workroom is downstairs. So I have lots of space here, and Donna Jean has space over in the corner of the house there, and such as that. Do you dabble any more in wine or growing grapes still? Well, I'll continue on that. Oh, okay, <clears throat> After moving over to uh, the house on Roberts Lane or off Zimmer Drive, I found, even while I was doing landscaping, that I, I needed to get out and be around people more. So I applied for a job at the Rex Hill Winery which had just gotten started. I think their first vintage was 83, which was a good year, by the way. And um, I was put to work in the tasting room there and worked there part-time for six years. And then I quit there for a couple of years and then worked a few months for, over at the uh, Ben Wall Winery, which is now Ann Amy over on the Mineral Springs Road. But they were, they were going to sell that place to uh, Robert Pamplin, and they left it. So I decided, well, I'm going to look around for another spot to work in the tasting room. And I will go back a few years as a preface to that. In 1985, when we were still at the vineyard, uh, Alan Holstein, who was the vineyard manager uh, for uh, Knuts and Erath at that time, came to me and said, uh, you've got a nice spot for making wine there in your basement. And uh, there's a man named Roland Souls who wants to try making wine here. He is an American, but he's been in uh, uh, Australia working for an Australian company. Petaluma, and Petaluma has sent him to this area to uh, see if we couldn't make good sparkling wine here. So Rollins spent an hour, uh, a year looking around here. So anyway, he made, he came there and um, he made his first wine there. We have a picture of that in one of those books. He and I uh, had a good time making wine in 85 and became well acquainted. In our basement. In our basement. So back to uh, my progression in the wine industry. In, 80, in 96, after having laid off of uh, Rex Hill for a while. Oh, by the way, one reason we moved up to the Viewcrest area was because Paul Hart, who was the winery owner, Paul and his wife, Jan Jacobson, we're going to make that a wine estate uh, area. They was 10 acres, and they were going to build a house and put a vineyard around each house. And you'd have your own wine, and you'd get a sale for the rest of the grapes. Well, it was a good idea, and I think they've done it in California enough. But it turned out he couldn't handle it. It was just too much expense. And I think also it was a problem with the city and the county of uh, doing something so uh, revolutionary as having a wine estate mm -hmm. around your house. So that didn't work out. So back to uh, Rollin Souls. We, I decided, well, I've known Rollin a long time. I don't want to take advantage of him, but I want to go back to work in the, in the wine industry. So I went in there and he put me to work. And that was 96, February of 96. And I continued working there until April of this year. April 17th was my last day at the Argyle Winery. And I've, I've seen a lot of things happen there, uh, which we'll discuss that later. So that's 20-some years, I guess. And I'm no longer in the wine industry. And uh, uh, we had our day. And we've seen a lot of things. So, 
uh, I guess that's about a summary of it. Anything else you... That's quite a timeline. Yes, it is. Uh, you were going to mention the difference uh, between the uh, society that we started out in and how the, the evolution to uh, the... Social. Yeah, the social way. So, Dr. Jean's question slash comment was commenting on the societal and social changes from when you started to now. Those two words should be combined with a third word. Society, social, that is society and or social, economic, and spiritual which are the underlying words for where we are in the wine operations these days. They are significant terms that have created an interest in not only buying wine, but people wanting to move here and take part in so-called lifestyle. And I heard that term just a month ago at a party up at uh, Torrymore Winery. We were invited there. Carrie and Donna Jean and I went up there for a party. Uh, and we gave a talk to their wine club. And we met a man who worked in Eastern, in Spokane, for a farm credit company. It's a government organization. And he said, well, this is fine, I have a good job, but I want to move down here and live the wine lifestyle. I didn't say anything, but I thought, well, there's more than one aspect of that style, too. Right. It's, it's a broad sort of thing that you have to understand. It, it isn't just uh, hanging around and sipping wine from time to time. So it uh, illustrates what I'm talking about of social, economic, and spiritual, because there's a lot of spirituality. We don't think much about religion much anymore, but we talk about spirituality. We're spiritual people. We're not just religious people. We like to think that we have spiritual thoughts that are important to life and to existence in general. And we're taking advantage of those in, in, in one way particularly, and that's the wine culture. It is something that attracts people. It has a back to nature. It's, a, it's something that uh, is important to our psyche anymore because we want to be in touch with, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, organic. We want to live an organic life. Mm -hmm. You all understand that. Mm -hmm. And that's what keeps the thing going. That's what makes it possible for all these wineries that have joined us here, all over the hills and all over the adjoining hills, and uh, have made it the vital force. And I don't remember how wine, many wineries, there must be hundreds of them, and many, 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 many more vineyards. And that's another subject I'd like to mention too, that I found that when we were in a, a vineyard place there and selling grapes, or trying to sell them, it became very discouraging. There wasn't much of a, an opportunity for selling grapes. There were a few. Uh, um, Irie, Erath, uh, Hinman, Hinman down uh, south of Eugene, and um, Adelsheim, and Amity Wine, Myron Redford. Those were just about what there was to be for a, a market. So the price wasn't very good. It was, it was hardly a, a living wage. And secondly, there was no guarantee we were going to get a good crop. and. Uh, it became obvious to me that the, the vineyard people were a bunch of suckers. That is a crude term, but it's, in my, I think it's still true. 
and I've seen it happen just within the last few years, 1912 or 2012 and 13 especially, are good examples of when uh, the crop is very scarce. And I know a, a, a vineyard over here up in the hills that they got practically nothing for the crop. And what they did sell, they had to wait a long time to get their money. So the wineries are the people who can survive. They can go up and down and they can, they can uh, get grapes somewhere and uh, succeed. But the vineyard people, they're dependent on every crop from year to year. That's, that's a typical farm story anyway. It isn't just wines. It's, it's, uh, it's farming in general. And vineyard operating is dirt farming, and which is not an insult to farming. It only means that you have to get your hands dirty. And you have to get cold in the winter when you get out there and prune those vines. Mm -hmm. When I was doing that, I got a good view of Mount Hood during the winter. It was nice and clear. And I, sometimes I could look out over the clouds, the low clouds of the low fog, a beautiful view of Mount Hood, which was very inspiring. Except I was a little bit tired, a little bit cold. And uh, I took it all in, though. So anyway, that was the reason, one of the reasons we moved to. So I didn't want to leave the industry entirely. And as I say, I stayed with it for 19 years at uh, Argyle and six years elsewhere. Now, speaking of wineries, <clears throat> we're experiencing, which was easy to predict, if you knew anything about business. Business is not a static matter. It has to be a growing, vibrant activity or it fails. And everybody in the, in, who is in a businessman knows that. So after um, David Lett, took his wine to France in 75, was it? I think it was 1975. He went to a, an exposition or a judging, uh, I guess it was in Paris. It was. Yeah. So lo and behold, <laughs> here he was up towards the top. Yeah, I think he was second. Second. Well, think about that, says Mr. Robert Douin. That can't be. There's a mistake here. We're going to do this again. Mm -hmm. So they did it again in another location. I guess they went to Burgundy, didn't you know that? So. They went to another location, and it must have been Burgundy. So what happened? It, it, they went up at the top again. So that was the reason that, of course, we have Domain Drew in Oregon. Mm -hmm. He became sold. And of course, they, they, they are doing a good job here. Next door to us are uh, Ashley, Ashley and uh, um, Aaron Bell, who work there. Ashley is the tasting room manager, and Aaron is the uh, cellar master. So they've settled in nicely. So that was one example of people coming to us from other areas to take advantage of the, uh, what was happening in Oregon. So the, um, that wasn't the, that was just the beginning. Mm -hmm. And now we have examples of people coming from out of state to plant vineyards and or create a winery. We have uh, Kendall Jackson planting in the Dundee Hills. And of course, Kendall Jackson is top notch in California. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, uh, Gilbert, I think it is, from France. Petaluma. Well, that too, we'll get to that. Okay. I should mention that. Uh, anyway, another famous French winery. And uh, another development was the California uh, retirement system 
buying land, which you know about, I'm sure, east of, west of Carleton, planting vineyards in what I didn't think was a very good spot, close to the mountains, a low area. But evidently, I think they've sold it subsequently and uh, came out all right. Lots of activity over around Carleton now. We all know about that, thanks to Ken Wright. And that brings up another subject of Ken Wright. I had experience with him. Uh, during the time that we were living up in the hills there, during the period of a year, um, Alan Holstein had came to me and said, there's a man named Ken Wright that I'd like to have you meet. He's living in um, the Monterey Carmel area right now, making wine for the Talbot Thai Company in the hills there. And he wants to leave that area and come to Oregon. And uh, he, he needs some help uh, to get going. I said, well, okay, let's, let's talk to him. And I had a telephone conversation with him. And then uh, he eventually showed up at our house there, uh, along with Corby Wright Souls, you know who she is, of uh, now uh, Rocco. That's another interplay of, of uh, Falcon Crest, was it? You remember that show? Did you ever see that show, Falcon Crest? So anyway, um, Ken wanted to borrow some money from me and wanted me to be an investor. And uh, I said, well, what will it cost? So he figured it all out. And he said, eventually, 200000 and I thought, well, I have the money, but I don't know whether I want to go into that marriage or not. So I decided not to. But I did selling my winemaking equipment. And I have a picture yet that shows in one of Kerry's books of a truck backed up to our winery in which sits all of my winemaking equipment. And there's Ken Wright, Alan Holstein, and myself. Mm -hmm. And I went to the house and shed a tear. I thought, well, it was a good dream, yeah. but there it goes. Bye-bye. <laughs> it was a hard party. Yeah, it was a hard time. Well, you've had incredible vision. Your entire time in the wine industry, you always seem to have your finger on the pulse. Where did that come from, that knowing? Did you just possess that? I developed a motto, which I have taught my daughter, Carrie. <clears throat> Have a vision, make the effort. Mm -hmm. And that's the only answer. And where that vision comes from, I don't know. That's genetic, mm -hmm. I guess. My dad was a very aggressive person. He started out uh, from nothing in uh, around Carleton, and he had built up a hay baling business. It does. Those days you could go around from farm to farm, set up a hay baler, and uh, do well. Uh, portable. Mm -hmm. a sta it's called a stationary baler. In fact, that baler is still in existence over there at the Yamhill County Museum, south of McMinnville. Mm -hmm. So he got started in that, and he was considered uh, fairly well off from that. So he bought then the place in McMinnville and went from there and was very aggressive there. And that led to the original, eventually to the, what's now called the winery district. And when he retired, my brother and I bought him out and enlarged the winery district. But we learned from him that you, you, you develop an idea and you go for it. And I think that had a lot to do with it. Uh, I'm sure it did, genetically. My great-grandfather, who came when he was 18 or 17 or 18, in 1844 to Rickreall, was a very aggressive person too. And he started farming in Rickreall, of course, after moving around here and there. And he eventually was the 
according to my dad, the second highest taxpayer in Polk County, which in those days meant you had a lot of land and you made a lot of money. And he had a partnership in a bank and in independence. And uh, not only that, he gave a lot of his land or sold it to his um, children. My father was born in, in, in Ricreal and other people were. And uh, they eventually moved to uh, Portland in 1900. And my dad always said that was the best thing that ever happened to me when we moved from Ricreal to Portland. Of course, Portland was a hot spot then and uh, still is. So anyway, back to my great-grandfather Joshua, a hard worker and a determined person. So after getting rid of all this land, he would, uh, well, back to that, to Rickroll. The, the house that they lived in there is still there in Rickroll. It's still in good condition. Some people living there have, have maintained it. So eventually he got bored and he decided he was going to make another homestead. Mm -hmm. And he chose the uh, Eagle Creek area, which is over by Estacada, up in the hills there. Mm -hmm. And he started a new farm. And putting up buildings. And he was one day on a, a wagon pulled by a horse. And they fell off and it killed him. Mm -hmm. So that was the end of him. But the point that I'm making is, he was a determined person, and he, I guess he passed the genes on down to us. <laughs> well, certainly to you. I recall your story earlier where you decided to believe in David Blatt, and your brother was the one that was skeptical. Very skeptical. So what was it about David Blatt that you said, all right, this guy might know what he's doing? Well, he was a convincing person. And... Uh, when he made his first wine in 1970, he made a, a one little error. It wasn't little, it was a big error. He made his wine in a room that was air-conditioned. It was cooled, a cool room uh, used for turkeys originally. And uh, the wine turned out to be very light and pale. So he called it the Oregon Spring Wine. Have you heard that term? I have, yeah. And he labeled it. And I, I have had some of that. As a matter of fact, I have, used to have wine from many wineries at that time, subsequent to that, which I eventually gave to the Oregon Historical Society. Are you familiar with those? Yes. I believe we've visited them a couple of times. Yes, good. Yeah. Uh, I wish I'd have saved them and given them to you at the time. I would have been... Yeah. We were a little late to the scene. Yes. They're still in good hands, though. Good. Well, anyway, insofar as David Lett, he was a, a convincing person, but he had to be very persuasive. And his uh, book uh, sales experience helped him there in selling wine. So he went from place to place. And one of those places he went to was the Harris Wine Cellars in Portland on Northwest 18th. Pardon? Was it 23rd? No, it was, uh, it was down several blocks. It was owned by a man named Bert Harris, who uh, was unique in opening up a, a wine shop. Mm -hmm. It was all uh, European wine, of course. So uh, I went in there one day to see what he had for wine, and he began to tell me about this fool out there in McMinnville who was making wine and he thought he could sell it and he ridiculed Lett unmercifully. Uh, Bert was kind of a joker anyway. So I thought to myself, well, Bert, let's wait and see here. You'll find out. And he did find out. So and so far as uh, Dave was concerned, uh, he was a very um, he had strong opinions he had to have mm -hmm. 
and it's reminiscent to me of a man named Walt Disney, who you might have seen the recent filming in OPB of Walt Disney. And I thought to myself about David Lett. Nobody was going to stand in his way. He may have run into some trouble and he was going to get the job done. And of course he did. He, I don't think, ever made a lot of money for various reasons. But he told me one day, he said, I still have to go out and visit the customers and sell wine. He said, I don't do it sitting here in the winery. I go out and I sell. And that's the way he made some money. He made enough money to buy a, a um, Morgan car. Do you know what a Morgan is? Well, it was like an MG. It was an English car built on a wooden chassis. But it was very, very, very uh, desirable for old car buffs. So he made enough money to have some uh, money for uh, luxuries that appealed to him. And I stayed acquainted with him for some time, until his death, actually. I'd see some, sometimes I'd see him in the uh, post office down here. He, he had a post office box here all the time. During that course of time, when I was working at Rex Hill, I was thinking also of our daughter Carrie and myself operating a um, tourist bus. And I thought, well, I need some recommendations to do this, to uh, act as a tour guide. So I went to David and I said, will you write a letter for me describing my experiences and my abilities, and will you give it to me so I can use it as a reference? And here's that letter, which I'm going to give to you today. Oh, thank you. To whom it may concern, this letter concerns Jim McDaniel, who I first met in 1970. This was during the time that I was looking for a building to use as a winery for my first vintage. After meeting Jim through a mutual acquaintance and discussing with him my immediate needs, he volunteered to let me rent part of a building that he owned. This worked out successfully. Eventually, I purchased the entire facility and made it what it is today. For $16,000. <laughs> <laughs> Another snort from my brother. Oh. What the hell are you trying to do there, anyway? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs> After Jim had been observing me make wine for two years, he became interested in the subject of vineyard management and wine production. In 1972, he purchased 15 acres in the Dundee Hills and began planting his own vineyard. He also planted a 10-acre vineyard in the Dundee Hills, which today is leased from Dr. John Bowers to Rexhill Winery. By 1975, he had built a home on his property and was continuing the planting of more vines, eventually planting a total of three vineyards. During these years and following, he produced grapes from various wineries, including my own, and became a part of the early happenings in the Oregon wine community. In 1978, he began making wine at his home <coughs> on the original vineyard property for himself and friends. He continued until 1985 when he sold the house and vineyard. In 1987, Jim began work at Rex Hill Winery as a member of the tasting room staff. At Rex Hill, he, was conducted, he has conducted winery tours, represented Rex Hill at various industry-related events in the Pacific Northwest, and performed various sales and public relation duties at the winery. During his 20 years of experience in the wine industry, Jim has gained a wide knowledge of the people and happenings in the Oregon wine country and is well qualified to act as a tour guide in this area, David R. Lett. So you can put that in the archives. That's wonderful. So what happened? Did you and Carrie make the tourist business or oh, other ventures presented? Carrie. Uh, well, I, I know the answer. What was it? Oh, she wasn't. I ask you what? the question instead? OK, we'll ask that later. <laughs> well, I didn't really want to do it for myself. I wanted to do it for Carrie. I see. And it just didn't work out. So anyway, I got a nice letter. And uh, I also got a verbal comment from David Lett, which I treasure. When I was working at Rex Hill, I was sent over to an event over at the uh, Domain Druin Winery one day. 
and Lett was there in a generous mood when we were talking. He said, you know, Jim, you could be in the wine business. He said, if it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't have succeeded because I wouldn't be able to make wine. I had no place to do it and I didn't have the money. So that was a, a, a little bit of an exuberant thing for him to do and it was not typical of what he would do. So I gave him a lot of credit for having a heart in, in the right place, even though I was kind of a crotchety person as time went by, as Papa Pino would be. Well, you are the one that believed in him. Yes. And got him started. That's right. I'm glad he said that to you at least once. I'm, I am too. Thank you. So those, that's, that's about my story. I don't know. Well, I have I, a couple follow-up questions. All right. Okay. Uh, the first is getting started in growing grapes. I know you had David Lett to ask questions of, but was there anywhere else that you went to to get support or gain knowledge and how to plant the grapes, when to know to harvest? Where does one go when you're the one starting the wine industry in the area? Oregon State University had a program, even then, an active program. Porter Lombard, mm -hmm. who you must know, he's in the, the uh, wine block down here. Mm -hmm. He and others, including... Um, Corey. Charles Corey, Corey and Dick Ira. Yeah. Well, not much from them. I bought vines from them, and that's why I guess I haven't discussed that very much. Um, so, uh, what was I saying? Well, you did go with your uncles, uh, your uncles who had had nurseries for years and years. There was, a, there was genetic knowledge there, too. Now, that helped a lot. My mother's family owned a large uh, nursery of uh, ornamental and fruit trees, mm -hmm. starting in 1890 here. And as I was growing up, I heard a lot of talk about planting and trees and agriculture in general, and family parties. And so I had some feeling for the subject of farming and planting and activities like that. Uh, and I enjoyed plant life. As I mentioned, I uh, did a lot of landscape uh, architecture work. In fact, I finished here at Argyle landscaping that place until they destroyed it. So that was a, a thing that helped a lot just to, to, to have the confidence of working with plant life. Mm -hmm. It helped a lot. In fact, it was necessary. Now back to the vines. Uh, and this is an old story about David, or uh, Charles Curry. Mm -hmm. And who came first? Well, I guess that claims will be made forever on that. And there is document, well not documentation, but there are plenty of things written. But anyway, when I was planting, uh, I became acquainted with Curry through, well, I don't know who. Anyway, uh, I contracted for some vines from him one year when I was still planting. And I gave him some money in advance because I had made enough money I wanted to save on some income tax and uh, buy in advance to get a tax deduction for it, which I did. I gave him, I think, maybe $5,000, maybe as much. <clears throat> and um, he was propagating plants at that time. So the following spring, when the time came to, for me to pick up my plants and put them in the ground, no plants. His business had collapsed. His buildings that he was using for his propagation purposes uh, on um, green cuttings had collapsed. And he was virtually out of business. And he and his wife surely stood there and looked at me and I looked at them and I thought, well, I'm going to you're going to give me those plants. They're going to figure out somewhere or the other for my five grand. 
So there on the ground were a bunch of so-called plants with roots sticking out there and the top cut off where they would take uh, cuttings to propagate uh, completed plants, ready to plant. And they said, well, we have these. You can take whatever you want, so what could you do? I took them and I planted them up here at the what is now the Tory Moor. And so they were the some of the very first Kuri clone, so-called Kuri clone that were planted, and they're still in existence here. And Kuri told me one time, and he said, I got those cuttings from Alsace, and which, of course, you'll know more about that later, you probably already know now. And he called it the, the uh, Bergheim clone. Mm -hmm. And I looked that up recently in a map in Alsace, and I found where Bergheim actually exists. And I also found out that Bergheim clone is a, is a Riesling, which I didn't know. So it is evidently a, a well-established wine area, as this a good share of the, the uh, French wine department of uh, France. And so far as Curry is concerned, he, maybe this isn't on the subject, but I'm going to say it anyway. When he went out of business here on David Hill in Forest Grove area, he went to Portland and as usual he had some ideas and he proceeded to start making wine on Southeast 8th or 9th, something like that, under the name of Cartwright Beer. His wife's uh, maiden name was Cartwright. Well, Curry was not very careful about his winemaking activities. He wasn't sanitary enough, especially with beer. You can't make any mistakes there and have good beer. So it just didn't sell very well. But he was the, the original, the, the pioneer for the craft beer industry in the state here and other states too. So he had lots of ideas. But eventually that failed and he went to California and was living in the Napa Valley at the head of the Napa Valley at um, Calistoga, where the Calistoga Springs are. And he had a bicycle shop there, which uh, I guess he was making a living. So he still was sensitive about bringing in that curry clone illegally, which he did in a backpack. But before that, when he was in the uh, vine business, he sold some vines t into California. And eventually, that became a well-known clone, the so-called Curry clone. Mm -hmm. And subsequently, a group of people decided to uh, honor him at a dinner celebration and ask him to speak about that Curry clone. And he said, what clone do you mean? The Curry clone. He said, I don't know anything about that. I can't, I can't tell you anything because I have no, in, no part of that. Well, he did. So finally he said, well, okay. If I don't get put in jail, I'll talk about it. So they had their dinner and, and Charlie got up and spoke and everybody had a good time. And it wasn't too much long after that that he became then an authority. He would tell all the other vineyard and winery people how to plant a vineyard and how to make wine. Wow. Now the reason I know this, and I know it for a fact, is that when I was working at Argyle, there was a man named Walsh, who was a vineyard manager, would come in there once in a great while and talk about California wines, and he told me that. He told me that twice about Charles Curry and the Curry clone. So 
that's another little point of human interest mm -hmm. uh, that takes part of the in this industry. And I want to finish, unless you have other questions. Do you have other questions? I think we'll take a break and go to Donna Jean for a bit. Okay. So if you want to do a wrap-up note. I touched on this before about what is happening to the wine business here. And two examples. One was Domaine Druin, Oregon, and the other was Argyle Winery, mm -hmm. which came about through the presence of Rollin Souls. And Rollin was never a heavy owner of Argyle. It was always uh, 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 Petaluma Winery, and that man's name was a. Uh, what was it? You remember his name? Uh, uh, you mean from Petaluma, yeah. Australia? Um, uh, Brian Crozier. Yeah, Brian Crozier. And he was a. Crozier was a, a very determined person and a hard worker. He was here a few times, and I met him and his wife. In fact, he planted a vineyard down by Lincoln. But eventually, the Lion Nathan Company, as it's called Lion in Australia now, approached Petaluma, Brian Crozier, with a buyout offer. What about Karen Beer? Wasn't that in the middle of that? Karen Beer is an owner of of the land. In fact, they are very influential from Japan. owner from Japan. And they eventually took over the Argyle Winery activities. And from there on out, it was just a matter of time before Rawlin Souls decided he was going to get out of there. Uh, and he did ultimately by starting the uh, Rocco Winery in Corby. And within the last two years, he hasn't worked there except as a consultant. And he still is hired as a consultant because he made Argyle and sparkling wine what it is. And the leading sparkling wine operator, producer in not only Oregon, but I think in Washington and even in California. The sparkling wine from Oregon is unique. It's just the right sort of thing. So this is a typical example of what happens when outside interests get involved in what's happening here. And now we have all sorts of intermeshing uh, ownerships. This place down there at Fifth and the highway, that little tasting room, is an example. Uh, and uh, the, there's a company in San Francisco that has invested in Wine by Joe, mm -hmm. and they've invested in a number of places. So gradually, slowly but gradually, large companies are coming in and taking over the wine business, and that will lead to a change. But it's not bad entirely. There are, there are two or three large businesses that virtually control the wine business in many ways. Gallo and uh, Conondago in the east. And another factor is the distributors. They're gaining control too. So it's a business activity, despite it being a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to live a few more years to see the sequels to that. So that's, that's my story. Well, thank you very much, Jim, for You're welcome. session of this.